second in his lectures in the cohomology of arithmetic groups. OK, so last time I tried to motivate the idea of looking uh, at towers. So uh, I want to consider, again, so two types of towers, which are in some sense often going to be the same. So here we consider some base manifold with the sequence of covers, which are usually Galois covers with some nice sequence of Galois groups. But I also want to consider something that is related often in our case, which is namely to consider actually instead of manifolds, actual groups. So perhaps gamma is some arithmetic group. And I want to consider containments of gamma inside a sequence of normal subgroups. Okay. All right, so associated to the, a tower, we would like to consider the cohomology of each object and consider them all at once. So we have the following definition of completed homology or cohomology. And to indicate the completion, I'll write a twiddle over the H. So this is something that's defined in terms of the tower. So there's different coefficients we can take. I'll just write out a few different things. So let's suppose we took coefficients in FP. Then what I would like to consider, so these maps give us corresponding maps on homology. And you consider the inverse limit. Well, similarly, if you were considering groups, you have just Something very similar, you can consider the inverse limit of the cohomology of the homology of the groups. Okay. So this is completed homology with coefficients in FP, but we can also write coefficients in ZP, and we can write completed cohomology as well. So let me just write them out just in the case of the M, since the case of the gamma is essentially identical. So with ZP, again, we just want to look at the inverse limit with coefficients in ZP. For cohomology, well, cohomology, the maps go in the other direction. FP. And also for cohomology, well, and for homology as well, you could consider, say, a coefficient ring like z mod p to the r, which is the limit m z mod p to the r. And finally, just this one is slightly different. If you want to consider cohomology with coefficients in zp, well, again, just like in Iwasawa theory, you have compact objects and discrete objects. And you have to be a little bit careful with how you take the limits. So to get ZP, I mean, ZP is really a kind of compact inverse limit of these guys. So this is just defined to be the inverse limit of the completed cohomology in Z mod P to the R. Okay. So you take a direct limit, and then you take an inverse limit. Of course, you don't need to do this with homology, because you would have two inverse limits that you can suck up into one thing. Okay. So just a brief word on the relationship between the case of groups and the case of manifolds. Well, in our specific case, when we're looking at Shimura varieties, or more generally, arithmetic manifolds, they usually can be written as just a finite, disconnected union of quotients H by some lattice. So what type of object is H? Well, we saw a lot of examples of this in Kai Wen's talks. It's like a generalization of the upper half plane. But these spaces here, well, they look usually something like a group 
or the real points of reductive group, modulo a compact subgroup, this object here is going to be contractible in the cases of interest. So if you have H modulo contractible space, well, that, that gives a very close relationship between the cohomology of the manifold and the cohomology of the group. So in other words, the cohomology of the quotient here is really just equal to the cohomology of the corresponding group. In fact, this was how group cohomology was first defined. So now the fancier way of saying it is that these are k uh, gamma 1 spaces. So you may have to be a little bit careful thinking about what this means, just because this group could have elements of finite order, and then you have to interpret this cohomology as really sort of an orbifold cohomology. But in all these cases, of course, once we start taking congruent subgroups, these will be manifolds. Okay. So really, in some sense, for the examples we'll consider, these will be the, in some sense, the same construction. Uh, yes, that's, thank you. These are, yes. All right, that, okay, now, yes, these are normal. Yeah. One should think about this as being, for example, SL2Z, and these will be the congruent subgroups. Yes. Thank you. OK. So let me again just remind you of some of the examples that I would like to consider. And then we'll actually start trying to compute these groups and see what information that they contain. So we certainly want to look at the example of M to be S1. And the covers given by the multiplication by p to the n map. Okay. Another example that's somehow very relevant is we take x to be a modular curve, and then we consider the cover by all these congruent subgroups. But of course, x doesn't just have to be a modular curve. So well, here, x could be, say, it could be a modular curve. Or maybe it's a Shimura curve. Or maybe it's a Shimura variety. Or maybe it's a Shimura manifold. Shimura manifold, well, it's going to be exactly quotients of this form in which gamma is just going to be a, a lattice in some semi-simple group. It's not just, I didn't invent it. I don't. Arithmetic locally symmetric space. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this, in some sense, is, is very similar. Another way of rephrasing this is to choose gamma to be an arithmetic group and to look oh, here at this sequence of congruent subgroups. If you ever have an arithmetic group, well, there's some map to GLN, and so it makes sense to talk about these congruent subgroups. So this example here and this example here by what I mentioned before, these are almost identical. But you have to be a little bit careful, as already came up in Shou Wu's talk, is that really there are some disconnected components. And you do want the disconnected components, because that really gives you a more interesting action of the center. And so it's a sort of a difference between an SLN and a GLN picture. But still, of course, you can still reduce this case to this case, as long as you also keep track of components as well. And one more example that I want to consider is something slightly more general here. I mean, here we could have think maybe about a lattice in a semi-simple group, maybe something like SLNZ. But maybe you also want to consider a lattice, say, in some parabolic 
subgroup. All right. Well, you'll see exactly what I mean by the examples. OK. So now let's compute these cohomology groups in some of these cases. So we'll start with the case of S1. That's the easiest example. So first, of course, we know the cohomology of S1. H0 is just Zp. And H1 is also Zp. All right, but what are these towers of maps? Well, here we have a circle, and here you have a bigger circle. I mean, these towers are just consisting of circles, with these maps are just winding around, these, uh, around themselves p times. Well, H0, H0 is just giving the component group. And these are all connected. So the maps on, the maps on H0 are isomorphisms. So that allows us to compute the completed cohomology of H0 with coefficients in Zp. That will simply just be Zp, because each time we have Zp and the map is an isomorphism. On the other hand, what are the maps on H1? Well, the maps on H1 are the degree maps. And these all have degree given by multiplication by p. So for H1, Zp, well, this is just the inverse limit of the sequence where you have Zp multiply, given by multiplication by p each time. But it's not so hard to see that this is just going to be trivial. I mean, there's nothing that can somehow exist if you just sort of, there's nothing in this inverse limit because its multiplication by p is just somehow killing everything. So just to summarize, so the H0 completed cohomology is Zp, but the H1 completed cohomology is 0. So another way of thinking about this is we've unwound the circle in terms of the completed cohomology. So again, this is not so surprising, because we can start to imagine actual an object at the top of the tower, which is namely just the real line. And this is the cohomology of the real line with coefficients in Zp. Right? The H1 has disappeared. The circle has been unwound. OK. All right, let's go on to the next example. Which is a modular curve. All right. So there are, again, there are two ways here of thinking about the modular curve. That's considering the sequence of modular curves which are all connected. And there's the sequence of modular curves in which you have every possible choice of, of Vey pairing, and you have something disconnected. And so that somehow affects the answer. So well, somehow in the connected case, then this H0 Zp will just be Zp. But in the, the non-connected case, well, we see we really are getting more and more components. Right? These components are really just given by a choice of root of, of, of p to the nth root of unity for larger and larger n. So what we end up with, I hope I wrote this correctly, is that this h0, well, what type of object is it? As we described before, it's an object that is a module for the comp completed group ring. So this is going to be a module for now the ring Zp, double brackets, well, GL2Zp. Because we're using the disconnected uh, modular curves, we really have this action of GL2Zp. We also have the action of GL2QP as well. But we naturally have just a module for this, which will be finally generated. And then what will be the module? Well, of course, the action of this group is just factoring through the determinant. 
So this will be ZP. Uh, ZP stuff. Okay. And that's really, in some sense, explains completely the difference between what happens when you look at the case of modular curves with components or just the arithmetic groups. You somehow just pick up another copy of how the determinant is moving things around. Okay. What else do we have? Well, of course, if you look at H2, you'll just get zero just because H2 of a classical modular curve is zero. These modular curves uh, are open, so they don't have any, uh, they don't have any fundamental volume classes. So finally, H1, well, we already did a computation right at the beginning of looking at what H1 of a curve is. If you take a cover with Galois group G, this H1 was pretty close in the Grothendieck group to something that was free over the group ring. And so what's going to happen when you pull everything back at once, you're going to get a very big module. So here, so let me just say this, is we'll have positive rank over this completed group ring. So it will be something very large. Okay. All right, so how does this change if, say, one looks at a Shimura curve? Well, something very similar happens exactly for H0 and H1. But if you take a Shimura curve, in other words, a compact curve, so you actually have a class in H2, You have to worry about that. So now let's take, say, x to be a Samura curve. So it's not, again, it's just a quotient of the upper half plane by now a, a co compact lattice. And so h2 of x of zp uh, is equal to zp. But when you take the covers of these Samura curves, Exactly as in the circle, the maps between these things will be given by the degree. And so when you take the completed cohomology in degree two, this will also vanish. OK. OK. So now I want to somehow move away from Shimura varieties now and more into the, the general realm of arithmetic groups, in the, which are somehow in the non-algebraic world. So now let me suppose that gamma n is the group SLN Z. And let me now specify that n is at least 3. OK. So again, this has some action on a nice space that's contractible. There's a quotient that gets you a nice manifold of finite volume. But this manifold is going to have no complex structure. And so that means it's harder to study using algebraic geometry. But yet we can still study in this kind of basic way. We certainly have. The sequence of subgroups. So instead of trying to understand all of the completed cohomology, let's try to understand what should be really the most basic case. Well, maybe H0 is the most basic case, but the next most basic case, which is to understand H1. So, well, let's just remind ourselves what H1 of a group is. It's just the abelianization of that group. So particular coefficients in Zp is just, is just this. So we're trying to understand the abelianization of these groups, SLNZ, and their congruent subgroup. 
So from the previous talk, we have some input coming from analysis, which is that namely, if we look at H1 of any of these groups with coefficients in R, we always get 0. OK, so there are really no classes. There are no automorphic forms contributing to this space. But this says nothing about nothing about the groups where we really care about the torsion. So for example, it says nothing about groups with coefficients in FP. So it gives you really no information at all. And so you're sort of, it's not so clear what's going to happen. I mean, a priori, when you start increasing this m, this could grow incredibly quickly. Maybe even you get something that looks like it has positive rank over the corresponding uh, algebra. All right, well, so let's instead think about it from the other direction. Are there some obvious abelian quotients of this group that we can write down? So are there some obvious abelian quotients? Yes. What you can do if you take gamma and p to the m, well, what are some obvious subgroups? There are other congruent subgroups. So for example, there's a map where you quotient out by now the congruent subgroup of level p to the 2m. And this quotient is abelian. It's matrices that are congruent to 1 mod p to the m, modulo matrices that are congruent to 1 mod p to the 2m. It's not so hard to check this is an abelian group. Well, that at least gives you some abelian quotients. And if you play around with congruent subgroups, you can quickly feel and quickly determine that that's the only type of quotient you can get if you take a quotient by a congruent subgroup. All right. Well, so, so far, I mean, this is a pretty paltry group in terms of size. So the question is, well, what else is there? What well, turns out is a very nice theorem Uh, do I really need 2m? Well, so if you have a matrix that's 1 plus p to the m times something else, and I, I multiply it by 1, OK, so if I take 1 plus p to the m a and multiply it by 1 plus p to the m b, I should get 1 plus p to the m a plus b plus p to the 2m times ab. And so that's equal to p to the 2m times ba mod p to the 2m. OK. Uh, thank you. Let me just erase that. Up. A theorem first proved, uh, I always should check the pronunciation of this name, which I will. I'm not going to commit on video to a gross pronunciation of this name. So first proved, and then also proved in a different way by the paper of Bass Milner. So the second paper sort of draws certainly on ideas from the first. So the theorem is that any finite index subgroup of gamma n is congruence. Remember, n is at least bigger or equal to 3. Since it's completely different from SL2, I mean, SL2 is pretty close. To, I mean, it is virtually free, and there are many, certainly, things in characteristic 0 quotients. But here, there's really nothing except these groups here. And so what does that imply? Well, by an elementary exercise, this is really the only abelian quotient. So in fact, it shows that gamma m p to the m 
Zp is isomorphic to gamma n p to the m modulo gamma n p to the 2m. So it's non-trivial, but it's not very big. But remember, we're taking an inverse limit here. So at one point, we're going to have a map from gamma n p to the 2m zp. Well, this is also non-trivial. In fact, it's even bigger. But the map from here to here to here is certainly trivial. So we have an inverse limit in which all the maps are eventually 0. And so the conclusion is that the completed cohomology is equal to 0. And this is really not a theorem about automorphic forms at all. This is a theorem which is somehow really a, a non-trivial integral statement. And to kind of give you an indication of how non-trivial it is, let me just write down a very related example. So still with n bigger than 3. And now let me suppose I take d over q to be a division algebra. Well, so to be explicit, let me say it's somehow split at infinity. And let's just say it has invariant 1 on n at 2 primes, at L1, L2, well, 1 on n and minus 1 on n at L1, L2, not equal to p. These certainly exist. Geometrically, what do these look like if you take the corresponding uh, arithmetic locally symmetric space? Just like with SLN, they're quotients of the same h by the group. The only difference is that these are now not only finite volume, but actually co-compact. But if you think about the characteristic zero cohomology, the automorphic forms, they in fact do satisfy a very close relationship between here and here. I mean, if you can imagine a generalization of the Jacquet Langlands correspondence, we can pass some automorphic forms from one to the other. But I can ask the same question here, well, the corresponding lattice. So let me suppose I take B1 inside D just to be the integral elements of norm equal to 1. Just because I'm avoiding P, there will be some map from this B1 to SLN ZP. So this is my choice of gamma. And because there's a map to SLN ZP, again, I have my tower in the right direction. And you can ask the same question you did here. What's the completed cohomology? Just of H1. You're only asking about abelian quotients. And the answer, well, conjecturally, the answer is, again, it should be trivial. And what is known? Basically nothing. Right? It could really be absolutely huge. Well, of course, it, it can't have things in characteristic 0 at finite level. But over FP, it could really be growing incredibly fast. And there's no way to control it using automorphic forms. And that doesn't leave you many tools. Okay. So again, the congruent subgroup property is conjectured for these groups. So the congruent subgroup property, well, I mean, there's, there's this version of it. There's also a slightly tweaked version in which you allow the congruence kernel to be a finite group. So, OK, so here is a side remark, maybe for the cognoscenti. So this is about groups of rank 1 and a half. So, well, what are these groups? Uh, UN1, maybe F4 minus 20 in here, n is at least 2. So the congruent subgroup property, what's well, known in the kind of these nice cases of these split forms for classical groups. But there are various groups here, SP and particularly U, even U21. These are groups of rank 1 for which Sayer conjectured the congruent subgroup property fails. So in other words, uh, he conjectures if you take a lattice inside here that it should sort of have cohomology that's not coming from a congruent subgroup. Well, sometimes you can prove this if you have split forms, but again, in a kind of compact form, or the compact uh, 
Lattice, it's a kind of difficult question. So it seems a little bit like this question about the vanishing of this is almost equivalent to the congruent suburb property, but it's not quite. It's a weaker property. Cohomology only tells you about abelian quotients. So it really only tells you about solvable quotients. So of the following conjecture is in these cases, the H1, well, vanishes or is finite. So stair conjectures, they should have these big quotients that are not coming from congruent subgroups. But an alternate conjecture says that as far as abelian quotients go, they look like they satisfy the congruent subgroup property. So, I mean, if that were really true, it would somehow indicate that it's hard. One reason why it's hard to prove this doesn't have the congruent subgroup property is you can't produce them, the quotients, by abelian quotients. Okay. All right, so at this point, it's looking a bit like, well, this is a nice notion to think about, completed cohomology, but we're sort of struggling to actually compute any of these groups in a real sense. So I want to now explain how things are even worse. But at the end of the lecture, things will get better again. So. So basically, for the same reason uh, as, as here, in terms of the congruent subgroup property, suitably interpreted, so if you take H, the completed H1 of gamma, now not to be SLN of Z, but SLN of the ring of integers of number field, and well, I'll be safe, I'll just say A equal to 3, so this, it is finite. Again, you have the congruent subgroup property up to some finite group that is related to the roots of unity in the number field, depending on if you have a real place or not. OK. This is a fact. This is, this is known. I, maybe this is already in vast mill also. OK. So now let me just change the group a little bit. This surely is not going to make it so much harder. Let's just choose GLN of OF. And in fact, if we only really care about things up to a finite index subgroup, this is not really very far from SLN OF times the units. So we know this part of the group is disappearing in terms of H1. So let's just think about the completed cohomology of this very simple abelian group, OF. I mean, what do I say when I say simple? I mean, it's, it's a finely generated abelian group. We know its rank. And if we want to compute the first cohomology, that's just the abelianization of the group, which means things are surely very easy. OK. So let's, in other words, compute H1 just for gamma is OF star. OK. So certainly, right. So we have to, wait, what does it mean to have a congruent subgroup of OF star? We're just looking at the units that are congruent to 1 modulo p to the n. OK, so certainly, so first, of course, this is a very simple abelian group. And we're looking at this map. Of course, it maps somehow p divides, well, let me, I don't even need to write that. I can just map it to OF modulo p to the m star. And then there'll be some kernel. And this will be the congruent subgroup here, gamma p to the m, by definition. Okay, it's just the kernel of this map. So of course we can see as abstract group what it's going to be. We just have a, an abelian group 
we're taking this map, it'll just be a, an abelian group of the same rank. And we can certainly see in this picture, as we start increasing m, we're looking at units that are more and more congruent to 1 mod p to the m. And of course, there are no units that are congruent to 1 mod p to the infinity. If you had such a unit, the unit minus 1 would have to be 0. And of course, the units certainly inject into any localization. All right, but we're not really looking at just the inverse limit of the cohomology of these groups k. Right, we're really looking at the cohomology of gamma p to the m with coefficients not in z, but, but coefficients in zp. OK, you say, well, how can this change things? I mean, zp is certainly flat over z, so you can just imagine all we're really doing is tensoring this picture with zp. And so all we're really doing is looking at the kernel of the map from the units tensor zp to the units modulo p to the m. This, of course, is a finite group. So tensoring with zp, all that does is just kill the prime to p part right at the bottom. So we're just mapping this. Well, of course, once we take the limit all the way up, we're just looking at the kernel to the map of p divides p, well, O, F, the completion. And here, tensing with zp is, is just really, we just have a map like this. And so all we're saying is, well, we certainly know that units congruent to 1 mod p to the m, the larger and larger m, there are no such units. And so all we're just doing is this fairly mild operation of tensing with zp and asking the same thing. And so surely the kernel has to be trivial. And in fact, surely that is true. But so here h1 is just the kernel of this map. So this is 0. Uh, well, I'm kind of ignoring roots of unity, so let me just say this is finite if and only if Leopold's conjecture is true. Now, this is not somehow a mysterious equivalence. I mean, this literally is what Leopold's conjecture is, right? If you imagine how you prove the unit theorem, you tensor with R, you map to the real places, you show it's a lattice, well, after you take the norm map, and that's how you compute it. You could try to prove the unit theorem by doing the same thing periodically, but you have this difficulty of showing you kind of get a lattice. Right, of course, the units are independent, but once you, you tensor with zp, there could be some weird kind of piadic transcendental relationship between the units that produces a kernel here. And literally, the statement of Leopold's conjecture is essentially that this map, well, tensor with qp, is injective. So even with this very simple group that we kind of feel we understand, you can't even compute as complete a cohomology. So you end up with Leopold's conjecture. Uh, which, well, so Leopold's conjecture is sometimes a notoriously difficult conjecture. I mean, I, there's a story of someone asked Pierre Colbert, why is Leopold's conjecture so difficult? And his response was, on the contrary, it's very easy. I've proved it myself three times. <laughs> Just because it's very easy to sort of imagine by this argument that, of course, well, it has to really be injective. OK, so there are always twists and turns. If you think you've proved Leopold's conjecture, you're wrong. OK. Uh, I started at 11, right? Good, I'm not 10 minutes over time. <laughs> All right. Well, there's at least one thing that you can say about this completed H1. I mean, whatever it is, it's at least as big, most as big as that. So you, you at least do something that's better than you get in the in the division algebra case, you can at least prove that somehow H1 of, of GL and OF is a finely generated ZP module. Okay. So let me just make a remark that I won't sort of say so much about. Suppose we're going to do the same with HD. Well, there's really two type of things that can happen. I mean, the cohomology of automorphic forms that are most of interest to us in terms of us as number theorists, in terms of Gower representations, they're sort of occurring in the middle degree. 
But you could still ask about what happens in very low degree. I mean, Borel tells you what happens rationally. You just get into trivial representation. You get something very simple that doesn't depend on n and only depends. It's just some simple finite, uh, well, finite vector space. So I just wanted to mention the fact that this, again, of this group here, GLN, oh, oh, F. So it is finally generated ZP module. It's independent of n, that's true for H1, as long as n is much bigger than d. All right, so that's, this is kind of a piadic analog of Borel's stability theorem. And you could try to imagine what type of information does this group contain. Well, what type of information does this group contain? It contains information like the congruent subgroup property, or at least some version of it. It contains information about a piadic regulator map. So similarly, this contains information about some higher piadic regulator maps. But it's sort of notoriously hard to kind of say so much about those. All right. All right, now I want to go back actually to some examples with Shimura varieties. And more precisely, I want to talk first for a little bit about boundaries. So Kai Wen talked a lot about when one is studying Shimura varieties. In general, these are just quasi-projective. And often, you would like to have some kind of compactification to get yourself, say, a nice projective variety. So in the simplest case, where we have, for example, modular curves, well, it's simple and in some sense a little bit degenerate. You have various cusps, which you know how to count. And a sort of perhaps a natural way of compactifying it is just to plug it in and put a point there, which is the, the minimal compactification. Well, of course, this kind of gives the wrong picture, because of course, if you can also make this smooth at this point, but only sort of by virtue of kind of a coincidence. But the various things that are unsatisfactory about this kind of compactification, I mean, one thing is that already we saw in Kai Wen's talks in high dimension, you're adding something very singular to the boundary of kind of high co-dimension. But there's something that's even not so great about this case here. If you think of a modular curve, and then you take this compactification, you change the cohomology. I mean, the modular curve has no H2. This compactified thing has H2. So you might ask for a compactification that maybe preserves more about the algebraic topology of the space. So, so I certainly don't have so much time to kind of explain the borel serre compactification, which is a nicer compactification. But I'm just going to draw it in this situation and two other situations. Another thing you could do, well, as long as you're prepared to have manifolds that not only have boundary, but maybe even have more unpleasant corners, instead of plugging in a point that kind of kills off the loop around that cusp, why not preserve the loop and just consider a manifold where instead you somehow have a circle here at the end? OK. So the point is, what's the difference here? is that here, if you have this borel serre compactification, and you have this map, well, you haven't kind of introduced this extra class here in H2. And so in general, you have a picture, you have a nice compactification that has the property that this is even a homotopy equivalence. So in particular, the cohomology of this is the same as the cohomology of this. Okay. So what else can you do? Well, when you have a situation like this, there's actually more than one cohomology theory you can start to think about. So this already came up a little bit uh, in Professor Spey's talk. But one somehow basic exact sequence one can imagine is comparing the cohomology of the boundary to the cohomology of the space and the compactly supported cohomology. So there's an exact sequence in which you look at the cohomology of the boundary, hope I get all these arrows the right way around, to the compactly supported cohomology 
of the compactification just to the cohomology of the compactification and so on. The chalk has disappeared. Okay. So we have this object here. Of course, this makes sense over an arbitrary ring. We can take a completed cohomology of this object here. Well, this is a perfectly nice cohomology theory, so we can also take completed cohomology here. So now, well, let's try and actually take this entire sequence and take the completed cohomology of the entire sequence at once. I mean, we can certainly just replace the Braille cell compactification of X by the Braille cell compactification of some congruence cup. Um, uh, sorry, what? Is this? Uh, wait, now I'm getting myself quite confused. If you, want, if you want to tell me what to put here without me having to think about it. Thank you. And I should just, good, we're happy, all right. Yes, I'm known for my sign errors. Okay, all right, again, we have a, right, a nice cohomology theory we can take. Solutions. So what happens with this? So what are we imagining here? Well, we're taking our modular curve, all right, we have, here, a circle, which is this boundary component. So what happens when we take a cover? Well, there are two type of things that happen. OK, here's my drawing. So we have a cover. So of course, the curve is getting more geometrically complicated. So what's happening at the boundary? Of course, these correspond to cusps, and we know that when we start taking covers, you get more cusps. But let's kind of ignore the aspect that we're getting more cusps. Let's just even kind of imagine one cusp and see what's happening locally here. So here we have a circle, and then here we're pulling it back, and what are we doing? We're unwinding the circle. And so this is exactly the example that we first considered of unwinding the circle. And so if we see what happened for the completed cohomology of here with respect to GL2, we see the completed cohomology just of the circle appearing in there. So we know if we take the completed cohomology of the circle, the H1 just completely disappears, and we're just left with the H0. But of course, the object you get there isn't a representation of, of GL2ZP. Where is that coming from? I mean, where do you see that? You see that you're getting more and more cusps. And sort of how many cusps do you get in the limit? Well, in some sense, you get, as sort of explained in Kai Wen's talk, P1, QP. So what is really the object you get when you take this completion just for, say, well, n minus 1 is equal to 0? On the one hand, you get the completed cohomology at, in H0 of this, which is just Zp. And then you get the induction to GL2 Zp, well, from P Zp, stabilizing the cusp. So you get a nice representation where this is just really the completed cohomology of the circle. And in a higher degree, it really somehow disappears. OK. Well, of course, this is maybe not the most interesting example. So let's now consider an upgraded example of the same phenomenon. So before I do that, let me just give one more example. So I've sort of talked a little bit about, well, let's consider the example of SL2ZI. So this is a group. It's a lattice inside something that, again, doesn't correspond to something algebraic. Uh, it has an action well, on sl 2 C modulo SU2 C, which is hyperbolic three space. So if you think about this, again, you're thinking about now some tower of manifolds. 
what does this manifold look like? Well, it's a hyperbolic three manifold. It's kind of complicated, but you can kind of maybe imagine, as we described last time, that you have some surface, maybe now it's with cusps, and then it somehow fibers over the circle. So that's kind of the picture of what this is. But now, of course, when we're unwinding this through congruent subgroups, unlike the previous time in which we're just unwinding the very simple circle, here we're unwinding it in a much more complicated way. I mean, the circle, in some sense, is going to stay the same, but this is now being unwound. So again, this is somehow quite complicated. Well, H0 will still be ZP. H1 will be something complicated. So now what about H2? So in fact, if you think about a three-manifold, H1 and H2 you can think about as being roughly the same. Well, it's not quite compact, but maybe you imagine some kind of Poincaré duality. So you might imagine, well, H1 and H2, the completed cohomology, might also be similar. But this is a kind of false idea, which we're already seeing for the circle, H0 and H1, that kind of dual. But the maps between them, on the one hand, are the isomorphisms, and on the other hand, the multiplication by P. And so if you sort of imagine, maybe this is coming from things in characteristic zero, here you have some Planck grade dual map, maybe these are also classes are also being unwound in some way. Of course, that doesn't quite say so much about torsion. But still, one conjectures that this is equal to zero. And it's a little bit hard for me to kind of explain uh, a justification for this. But it's related a bit to, to Taylor Weil's arguments, existence of certain primes that allow you to, to, to make this argument work. So let's just somehow grab this. But here we have a picture which is complicated. And again, the reason it's complicated is that, it, again, there's not really any connection with algebraic geometry. On the other hand, there are well-known conjectures that say that associated to both the characteristic zero classes and the torsion classes, this should be Gower representations. So sort of a massive generalization of Sears conjecture. So the question is, well, how could you possibly say anything about the Gower representations? I mean, they, they should still be encoded in these compl completed cohomology groups, because by the Hochschild Sears spectral sequence, you can always recover the finite levels from the top level. So this should be really interesting, but yet there's no obvious access to what's going on here. OK, so now I want to give my final example. So now I'm going to take a unitary group of type 2, 2. So Kai Wen told you, well, there's lots of unitary groups which you could give to that name. So let's, we have to choose some Hermitian form over some imaginary quadratic field. Let's just imagine the imaginary quadratic field is QI. And let's just imagine the Hermitian form is what you would guess it to be. OK, so what's the dimension of the corresponding Shimura variety? Well, the corresponding Shimura variety has dimension 4, but 4 is equal to 8 real dimensions. So Kai Wen explains how to think about a compactification of this by looking at maximal rational parabolics. So the story with the borel sayre compactification is, again, related to this picture of looking at rational parabolics. But now you have to consider many of them. But there's another feature, actually, that, that, that came into this picture. I'm not going to try and write down the stars. But you imagine you choose some parabolic. So in the minimal compactification, you just think about this M, which is the Levy subgroup. And that has a nice corresponding object there, and that's the thing you plug in. In a borel sayre compactification, you also take the n into account. Right? So, of course, we can see this already in the case of these curves here. I mean, the, the parabolic here is just the borel, and if you just look at the levy, you essentially have something trivial, GL1s, and you get points. But if you consider here the nilpotent part as well, well, what's the group you have there in the lattice? It's just the Z, which is the fundamental group of the circle. So without listing all the kind of parabolics that come up in this case, let me just 
talk about a specific parabolic, which is namely there's a parabolic in which the levy corresponds, well, to, G shouldn't say if I GL2 or maybe SL2, well, let me say that the lattice inside the corresponding levy is this subgroup here, which is exactly what we're interested in. OK, so naively, you might imagine, well, maybe I take my eight-dimensional thing and I plug in these three-dimensional manifolds at the boundary. Of course, that's not wrong. We have to take into account the end part as well. So here, this sort of has dimension three, but the dimension of the end part is four. So what is the object that's being glued in in the boundary? Of course, here I'm just talking about one parabolic. No, just because the units are finite for a moment. Yes, yes. Well, this will be, the lattice will be basically this. I just don't want to lie. Well, okay. So, so what type of object, this is my eight-dimensional object, what type of thing are you gluing in? Well, you have your, uh, we had this M that corresponded to here, this lattice. And what's the object that we have? Well, here, of course, you go from a point to a circle. Here you have a bundle over this that's coming from N. So the bundle, I mean, it's essentially close to a circle bundle. Maybe it's a nil manifold bundle. But you have, this is sort of a four-dimensional bundle. Well, the fibers are four-dimensional that are kind of increasing the size and sort of inflating it up to give you something nice at the boundary. All right, so now let's try to think about the completed cohomology of this and how it interacts with the boundary. So what happens is exactly what happened for the modular curve. So on the modular curve, the way the boundary gets completed is in two different ways. On one hand, you just think of a boundary piece itself, and you do the, its corresponding completion. Well, of course, you don't see the levy part here because it's trivial, but you see the end part here, and the ends are just circles, and they're all being unwound, and they disappear. So what happens here? Well, all these circles, all this nil manifold part, just completely unwinds when you go up the tower, and it completely disappears. So what you're left with is just really the completed cohomology coming from this. Namely, it's exactly these objects that you found were really interesting and now going to appear in the cohomology of here. But there's still something we haven't quite done, which is namely, of course, there's not just one cusp. It has to get translated about. And so what's the representation we're really going to have? It's just going to be an induction from this parabolic, so here's this completed cohomology now of, say, SL2 ZI. So this is a representation, of course, of M and then of P, and then you have this induction that you see inside here. And this is, in some sense, a remarkable, remarkably nice, because here we have something that we had no idea how to understand, and at least we have some relationship with the cohomology of something that has a nice property. Well, of course, <laughs> The relationship between this is sort of, of course, being known for some time. And even without unwinding the circles, you get a relationship between the cohomology. The idea is how to exploit the relationship here. So very recently, there's been two, uh, two very nice papers that have exploited exactly this connection. One of them is by Kai Wen and Richard Taylor and Michael Harris and Jack Thorne. Those names are not alphabetical, but they should be, but I can't do that in real time, which I won't talk about. But I want to talk about some work of Peter Schultzer. So again, there's a relationship between this now and maybe the completed cohomology of some Shimura variety. So let's just suppose that we're, say, looking at the completed cohomology just with coefficients in FP. We know we can build it all up from Z mod P to the N. So, I mean, a priori, this is still kind of complicated to understand. If we just started with a Shimura variety, it has cohomology in different degrees, no mean feat to try to understand what's going on. Uh, so what is it that Peter Schultz does that allows, say, for one to analyze it a little bit more? Well, since essentially I have time, I'll have to give you the cartoon version. <laughs> 
I'm happy to do that. So, well, first, you have to take this ring and tensor it up with a bigger ring. So here we just tensor it up, say, with O, C, P, mod P. And so what he does, in a very loose way, is that, remember, we're talking about this object as sort of playing the role of, of what's at the top of the tower by taking a limit. But there's not something, obviously, at the top of the tower. So one thing he's done is kind of introduce an object which one can talk about in an actual arithmetic geometric sense that plays the role of something at uh, the top of the tower. So it's the cohomology of something with some appropriate uh, sheaf. So this is an almost equality, but you can just ignore that for now. But let me just remark something about this. This is not, this object here was really a Betty cohomology. And if you have a Shimura variety and it's a Tal cohomology, that's a quite different object to what's occurring here, which is really a kind of more classical cohomology of, uh, of, of a sheaf. And in particular, one consequence that you get that's highly non-obvious for Shimura variety, so this, the dimension of this, well, it's n, say, complex dimensions. I mean, just the Shimura variety and 2n real dimensions. So if you think about the Betty cohomology or the Atal cohomology, this could be non-zero up to degree 2n. But here, this is just some usual chief cohomology. And by Grothendieck, this vanishes if you're above the dimension of the actual space. So rem remarkably, you do this is zero if i is bigger than n. Even though this is an almost equality, you can still extract from this Without, without really any little difficulty, that this completed cohomology vanishes for d to bob n. So we already saw one example, which was a very silly example, of Shimura curves. They had an h2. This h2 disappeared in the limit. But that's true somehow much more generally. These cohomology classes in high degree are all vanishing. Well, of course, that's not all that Peter did, but it's all I have time to talk about now. Sorry, I have time.